man who's been changing the game in applied sports science in Australia and the world for years. The man who is the most passionate coach in the game. The man who is not scared to ask the hard questions to make the industry better. Welcome, Welcome to, to his show. show. Welcome to Ask Woodford. And here is your host as always, Christian Woodford. Okay, guys, and welcome to episode 58 of Ask Wood. Yeah. Ask 58, Ask Woodford. I'm your host as always, Christian Woodford. As you can see there, as always, in the morning, I give Brick his Italian kiss. Yes, I love my staff here, and I especially love my sweet, sweet Brick. Episode 58, brought to you by MacIronFitness.com.au. Christian Woodford Signature Series. And I want to thank, as always, Bryce, our producer behind the camera. Pleasure as always, mate. 29 minutes or 28 minutes of absolute fire. Episode 58, Ask Woodford. Let's do it, Bryce. Alrighty, so first question, mate, comes from Daniel Tamaro, I think. Yep. Apologies if I got that wrong, mate. Yep. Uh, hey, man, do you, how do you program AFL conditioning sessions? Most clubs I've seen, no, most, most clubs I've been at, got us doing ridiculous heavy volume, long distance endurance stuff, yeah. then immediately accept us to be, expect us. He wrote that wrong, that wasn't me. Uh, expect us to be explosive. <laughs> that, wasn't my, that wasn't me. It's just how you said it was just really weird, sounded like you stuffed up. Um, that's a really good question and something that's been um, an issue for years. But, and you got to think, it's 2020, what the fuck do we still have clubs doing for warm-ups, I don't know what you do. I'm not going to throw you under the bus here. Even though you are going like this, yeah. I am throwing you under the bus. I've got a bit of a bit of a input on it. Well, no, no, it'll be interesting because remember, I stopped playing when I was 24 when I went to America for four months. And then I came back and I couldn't do it because, as you know, it takes up so much of your time. Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday. I love it. Like, I love it. I still miss it. But for you at 19, are you 19 or 20? 20, mate. Well, still, no, you're a kid. But what I'm saying is, it takes up a lot of your time. And you work full-time. And most of the time, I could be wrong, they're doing... They go to training. It's 2020. Science has advanced since your uh, two, two slow laps, low-intensity laps, static stretch, stretching, and then skills training. Now, I'm not going to throw your club under the bus here, but what do you guys do for a warm-up? And what do you guys do for someone who's still in the system who could be playing VFL, but... Let's be serious. It's very hard for kids. And that's just being serious. Same as Derby. Same as all my guys to be playing VFL once. Like, Frankston, okay, yeah, maybe. You do get a shot. But still, all the guns go there because it's not affiliated. Williamstown is ridiculous to get a game. Port Melbourne, similar. Now, if you're affiliated with a club, you're at, you were at Sandy VFL. They're linked with St Kilda Football Club. To get a game for Sandy is, let's be serious. They're not going to pick you over an AFL list of play. Unfortunately, that's how it is, right? Oh, I was probably one of the last. I reckon I was probably one of the last ones. So. But still, but still, you had a good. You know, you went there for the experience, yes. and now you've gone. Okay, well, you worked with Hendo for a bit. Um, uh, Brett Henderson, who'll be on Ars Woodford. Um, I'm going to have him on Ars Woodford. Darby told me do not have him, and when Darby said that, well, you know what I'm like. If someone says don't, I'm going to do it. And also, he's my mate, Darby. So unfortunately, that's how it's going to go. Um, but. What do you do at the club of, uh, like, seriously, what do you guys do for your warm up? What do you do for your preparation and conditioning? Uh, yeah, where we, we get to training, we've got, we've actually got an SNC bloke that. You have a what? Like, SNC guy? Yeah. Jesus. So, the, like, the club. What leg are you, what that, leg you so? Just so everyone knows. Uh, Mornington Peninsula. Is that Div 1? Uh, no, nah, not yet. Huh? Not yet. You're not Div 1, and you got an SNC <laughs> coach. Pretty good. Yeah, so the club invests in that, which is really good. Um, it's good yeah. to see when clubs do do that because it what? shows the care for the players. Well, yeah, it's very true. Um, but yeah, we run through like 15, 20 minutes of sort of warming up, sort of Shit. static stuff. Um, oh, you still do static stuff? We do pretty much a range of everything. Yeah. Of mobility, everything yeah. like that, which is really, I find it really good. Um, yeah. I just can't stand when sort of... I've got a big opinion on sort of the, the pre-seasons and everything like that for football. What's your opinion on pre-seasons? At local level, they're expecting like some clubs. Obviously, it depends what level the league's at. Yeah. But you've got blokes that are coming up that barely train, barely go to gym, barely take care of their body. Yeah. That they're expecting to come up and do three sessions a week that are going for 4Ks. Very good. Like Very, okay, here's my opinion know. on that, right? So right now, what's going to happen, just for everyone out there, 
It's going to happen in the AFL. Notice how the AFL is pushing preseason back further and further. What's going to happen with the AFLPA? It, all the players are going to come back. It's, it's going to happen in my, it, very soon. AFL players are going to come back in January. The whole fucking pre-Christmas thing is stupid. And then yeah. amateur teams are all going to follow suit because apparently, apparently, if the AFL does it, everyone should do it, right? My take on it has been this. Yes, you should train. Yes, you should put, put in prep work. The only reason why you do pre-Christmas training, do you want to know the only reason? is pretty much team camaraderie, team body. That's it. Yeah. No reason other than that. Yes, you should have structured strength, power, physical prep sessions. Yes, you should be doing some sort of skill work. But coming back pre, pre-Christmas is stupid in my opinion. We have pre-seasons that are way too long. If you look at the NFL, which is pure alactic, ATPPC, which is anaerobic, aerobic, um, they do eight-week pre-seasons. We do six months. It is ridiculous. By the time, why the fuck then are AFL players still sore after fucking round one? Why? They do a six-month pre-season. Too long, burnout's too much, got to come back in January. Same thing for the amateur players, right? This kid asked me, what do I think of the um, uh, uh, conditioning sessions? A, it's not really my area. If I looked at my area, I'm pure, fit, my special, my area, I believe, which I like, is what neuromuscular, it is um, athlete development, strength, power, speed. Um, conditioning is real, uh, uh, an area within itself. Yeah, you should, I know, basically, understand work rest ratios and um, understanding um, the, how to condition. Um, but a guy like um, Jay Ellis is more like understanding of the GPS, requ- uh, GPS understanding, conditioning requirements. In my opinion, I think we focus way too much on long, so distance and aerobic conditioning. I'm not saying that's not important. I used to think, oh, doing any long, so distance work, running work is wrong because it's going to make you weaker. It's going to make you slower. I mean, that's. I reckon in general, if you have just a, a balanced approach, I think it's okay because you do need an aerobic base to perform and to recover. But what most coaches do is they flog the fuck out of the players and it's not, in the end, you're going to think you're going to get overuse injuries, especially because they don't load them properly. I mean, Bryce, do you, I don't know what you, your coaches do, but they want if they're flogging you in pre-season and there's not some sort of step approach in terms of loading. Load isn't a bad thing. We know that. We need, we need load to bulletproof or prevent injuries. We know that to, pre- to expose them to stress. But spiking in loads, like example, coming back day one pre-season and doing like a 6K road run or something, it's just fucking dumb. I don't know if you guys do that. No, it's not to that extent. Yeah, but, but what, I, what I'm trying I to say is, a lot, this question is how would I do it? Personally, my opinion, and some people won't want to agree with this, but this is just once again my subjective opinion, bear in mind that my area, my... um. um Area special, my area of interest isn't conditioning. I think it's boring as shit. I think for me personally, I love the, the, the more powerful athlete, the quicker athlete is the better athlete, is the athlete with um, reduced chance injury. But you're in a running field based sport, court based sport, you need to run. You need aerobic capacity. You need repeat effort. But also, you need speed reserve as well. You need power. You need repeat effort. You need elasticity. You need all these qualities. So I think the best way you're going to get conditioning through, in my opinion, is through A, small-sided games, B, the skills work as well, C, match conditioning as well, because you're hitting two birds, one stone. So doing extra supplementary work, if needed, yes, I understand. But if you're just running them for the sake of running them, when you can get some skill work in, i.e. time efficiency, either A, B, bang for your buck, I think that's a better way of getting conditioning. Because you're hitting two birds, one stone, aren't you, Bryce? The skills work and the metabolic conditioning and the, uh, and, and the motor pattern, the specific muscle group, motor pattern, time and coordination, metabolic pathway. So a lot of coaches do that. Do you know what? To make them feel tired, to feel like they've achieved something. Well, achieving something is fucking stupid if you just fucking flog the fuck out of them. No point. Have structure. Example, first four weeks, I'll be developing a base. I'll be getting a base capacity. So you're doing everything at a slower intensity, developing aerobic capacity, um, building, that resi- uh, building that base. So if you don't have that base, right, let's say you don't have that aerobic base, right, you can't build the house because the ba- aerobic base is the foundation. And then as we get closer to the season, intensity, speed increases, volume decreases, and that's where you get more specific with obviously your games and then um, your games, your work restoration and stuff like that. That's where it, co- it gets closer. You need to develop more repeat effort, more speed work, stuff like that. 
But you develop the aerobic capacity. Listen, I'll tell you something for, um, what was his name? Um, Daniel. Daniel. Daniel, that's all I need. Daniel, I'll tell you something, right? Developing aerobic, con um, developing conditioning is easy. You can get someone conditioned in four to six weeks. If not, it's fucking simple. It requires effort and fucking volume. To get someone strong, to get someone powerful, to get someone quick, that takes knowledge, that takes a lot, a lot of time, right? Conditioning is fucking simple. When I hear all this bullshit about going, oh, he got this guy, this guy's a guru high performance manager. Oh, he's running them 40 kilometers a week. Oh, fuck, it's not that fucking hard to run someone, just run. It's not hard, you're in a competitive environment with people compete. You go to you go to training, right? There's competitive people, right? I hate losing. Unfortunately, I'm not very conditioned right now, but fucking I hate losing. Mac on fitness are coming to you. I hate I hate losing, right? But it's not that fucking hard to do cross training with the players or to run them. It's not. They're conditioned already. Do you know what they're not though? They don't have that base of strength, power, speed. Especially in football. We have no emphasis on it. It's run them, run them, train, and then lift. And what's the emphasis on lifting then? Nothing. No wonder we have so many fucking injuries. Emphasis should always be, I would lift them before they do any training. And you might think that's backwards, everyone out there. Oh, well, he's just being biased because that's his area. Yes, I am heavily biased. But here's the thing. If you actually lift them and you stimulate their central nervous system and you don't do stupid volumes or stupid exercise that fatigue them, when they do run, they're going to feel better because we know we can potentiate the nervous system and then when they do train, psychologically they're going to be switched on. That's why we do a priming session before a game. They're going to feel better and they're going to run better. Ding, 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 ding. Because we know strength facilitates endurance. Endurance doesn't facilitate strength. Fuck me, that annoyed me. Anyway, that's my opinion. Did I, did I answer that question at all? Yeah, you did. Boom, boom, boom. Sort of, I think but but here's more. the thing, right? Someone says to me, if I was to go to an AFL club, number one, I would never go to an AFL club. Why? Because they don't fucking invest in s &C. They think we're a dime a dozen. They don't respect us. They'll pass 40 grand in 50, 60 if you're lucky. I know an AFL s &C guy, bro, who said this to me. I go, oh, how, how are they paying you? Oh, I don't know. I just signed the contract. <laughs> this is the issue with Australian sport is because physical preparation is seen as second. Everything is secondary. I mean, the AFL coach gets 300 grand and then we get like 50, 60 if we're lucky. The high performance guy gets a stupid amount. But it's like, honestly, man, it's not respected. Not respected at all. And until it's respected, hey, until it's fucking respected, we're still going to see injuries in the AFL. Like, example, AFLW. What's the biggest injury in AFLW right now? Knees. Knees. ACL ruptures, right? Do you know the best way to prevent them? No, not doing stupid more research. No, not fucking looking into ventral cycles. We can't control that. Do you know what we can control? Investing in physical preparation coaches. It's not like there's, there's fucking billions of them crying out for fucking work experience or fucking work. Hey, motherfuckers, how about you pass what we're worth? How about you pass what we're worth? Because that's the best way of preventing it. Not fucking more research. Or well, let's research them more. Hey, why don't you look at sports in America, the collegiate system, that have female athletes? Look what they do to prevent them. Oh, my God, holy shit, it's a physical preparation program with a coach who's educated and applied. What do you pass fucking money? That's our fucking profession. Assholes. Fuck you. Next question. I don't know where I went with that. Fuck them. I'm sick of people not paying our profession. Can, can you fix up that? What? Supplement. That. Yeah. Now, nah, fuck, any, oh, fuck anyone who doesn't respect our profession. Now, nah, fuck them. Because you know what, Bryce? When I came back, I fucking love this job. I love it more than life. And I fucking really do care. And I don't know why people still have cracks at me. You know, it's always like, well, I'm trying to help the profession develop. Because I'm asking hard questions. You're, you know, these pussies do nothing. Yes, sir. No, sir. Or you... You work with this house, they guess so. It's like, shut the fuck up, little bitch. Next question. Fuck that pissed me off. Right. And do something about my swearing. What are you going to do? Nothing. I'm the king. Better than the king. I'm a king. All right, next question. Kieran, sorry. But I'm not really. Go. Dylan Clancy. Yeah, Dylan. Instagram. So he said, I think he complimented your tips on the speed article or something. Uh, oh, did he? Oh, very nice. Thank you. But the question is, would sprinting more to get faster yeah. increase the repeat efforts of fast sprinting, if you know what I mean? Really, uh, question was kind of disjointed, but I think he was, was. He say, what he's saying was, if you improve your speed reserve, which is your maximum outputs when you're fresh, when you're sprinting, will improve your repeat effort performance. I'm correct yeah, in saying that. I reckon that's... Well, I think that's your question. If it is your question, well, yes, it would, because your maximal outputs are higher... But saying that, though, repeat effort is deriving energy through what we call the no-man's-land pathway. We have three pathways. 
your a -lact a lactic, right? Your ATPPC, which is your short-term, high-intensity, anaerobic, high-energy bond system. Your aerobic, which is the low-intensity system, which uses predominantly fats and carbohydrates for energy. And your an anaerobic glycolytic pathway, which is the one needed for a peak effort performance. Carbohydrate is the prime substrate um, source for energy, right? So what you're saying is, if I improve my speed reserve, my maximal outputs, will it improve my repeat effort performance? Well, yeah, it probably would make sense, but at the same time, you need to be doing repeat efforts to get used to buffering that byproduct you get from anaerobic glycolysis is your lactate and your hydrogen. Now remember, your lactate buffers, which are bicarbonate, remember lactate isn't this, um, that burning sensation. We know lactate is used in fuel in aerobic respiration, right? What, what is that burning sensation is the hydrogen ions. And what happens when lactate accumulation overtakes lactate removal, the muscle becomes acidic. It inhibits nerve conduction, and that's where we get the burning sensation. Not the lactate in the blood, which is used as a fuel source. You need to be training in that pathway, and you're going to get it when you play football anyway, because it is a repeat effort sport. So this is why I say... The bucket you need, your job as a performance coach is to fill the buckets up they don't get in their sport. What is the, what is, what is the bucket they don't fill up? Speed, power, max strength. Those don't fill them up. The minute you fill those neuromuscular markers up, trust me, you're going to get better at everything. As long as you're integrating it with the skill and developing the motor skills like jumping, landing, which is force absorption, acceleration, deceleration, force absorption, change direction. It's a skill. The more times you do it, the better you get at it. Okay, you have to fill up those buckets. Have to fill those buckets up. Bryce, was that your phone? Yeah, man. No, I don't want to get angry at you, Bryce, but this is Ask Woodford. Don't. Episode 48, Ask Woodford. Don't yell at me. No, I won't. All right. Next question. Yes. Are you happy with that answer? No, I'm cool with that answer. I think that was a good answer. Perfect. All right, next one. Yeah. Comes from Marcus0002. Um, he knows it's a little bit illegal, but have you ever seen any research on using HDH yep. or steroids to speed up it's, or aid recovery? This, this guy actually asked his physiologist, and um, he's like, why are you asking me that? That's a, that's a good question. Like, I, I don't understand what the issue with, with, with this is if you're not playing sport and you want to speed up the process. Um, uh, listen, I'm, I'm not an expert. That's an endocrinologist at this, so I really can't answer this question the best of my life. Like, I, I'm not like in terms of you have to ask someone who actually understands it better than I do, but it makes sense. It would speed up the process. Why? More testosterone. Do you say testosterone or growth hormone? Uh, I'm not sure. You just wrote using HGH or steroids. Well, yeah. If I, yeah it, would, it would speed up the process, obviously, because it, it's going to help with recovery. That's what it does. It makes sense, yeah. But I can't understand why he's, he, he, he's trained or whatever it was. It was a stupid question. No, he said, so he's like, after he asked that question, it said, obviously in the competitive world, it's against regulations. Correct. I'm just surprised I haven't seen anything overseas about it being used. Uh, yeah, he, I, I don't know. I think he agrees with you, Eric. Like, it just makes sense that it would. Yeah, of course it makes sense. Yeah, it would. But once again, if you're playing sport and, um, yeah, it just gives you, gives you an unfair advantage, obviously. Um, listen, if you're not playing sport, yeah, that's fine. Like, you're not playing sport. I mean, but if you are, no. Use common sense. Common sense is not that common. Next question. This is not really another one. Are you? That's all right. Nah, next one. Yeah. Um, comes from Facebook from Liam McClure, uh, I think. Yep. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, mate. Uh, he said, Good day, mate. I'm currently in third year sports science. He's I'm currently a third year sports science student over in New Zealand and I love reading your content and putting what I learn into practice where I can. I'm currently looking to do a research on project, research project on post-activation. Potentiation. Potentiation. Yeah. Um, PAP. Post-activation potentiation. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you've had any experience in this area and your opinion on it, if Ooh. this benefits athletes in their results. Very good question. And I just talked about priming before. So I talked about why I would do strength power training before I did any skill-based training or conditioning-based training. Similar to post-activation potentiation. So now, for everyone out there, I'll explain post-activation potentiation. It is, I used to think it's a neurological phenomenon. It's not apparently. Apparently, it's at the muscular level, but that's bullshit as well because, of course, it's going to be at the neurological level because the nervous system drives and controls skeletal muscle contraction. The muscles are a slave to the brain. 
Post-activation potentiation, all it is, is is doing either a strength movement or an explosive movement and pairing it with a subsequent movement that potentiates that movement. I'll give you an example. Contrast training or complex training is coupling together two biomechanicals, biomechanically similar movements. I'm going to say that one more time. Complex or contrast training is coupling together two biomechanically similar movements, one being a strength I'm a heavy load strength movement, the other being a light load power or speed movement. Now the idea here is the strength movement with anything over 80, 85% of one RM, which is a heavy load, which the actual bar speed might be slow, but as long as the intent is to move the weight quickly, we're gonna increase bone recruitment and enhance the training effect. That's where we're gonna stimulate more of the central nervous system and increase high threshold fast switch motor unit recruitment and do so quickly to neurological efficiency. The whole idea of post-activation potentiation is recruiting those big, high threshold fast switch motor units. Okay, we wanna do that to stimulate more of our central nervous system. We rest between 30 to 60 seconds, and then we do our subsequent similar biomechanical movement. Example, a squat or an unloaded counter movement, um, counter movement jump. A static, um, like it might be a squat from pins, a concentric squat from pins, to a, a squat jump, which is literally the same biomechanical, mo bi biomechanical movement, um, which is, a static jump, which is a concentric only movement unloaded, so which is an explosive movement. Now, generally speaking, the difference between power and strength training lies in the load and the speed of movement. Also, exercise selected always want to be ones that project into free space. Why do we want that? Because with strength training, we think of a bench press. With a bench press, we're pretty much decelerating straight, straight, straight away. So we're increasing antagonist, which is the opposite of agonist, which is a prime mover, co-activation. We're slowing down, we're decelerating the movement. How do we overcome deceleration? We project in a free space. So it might be bench press to bench press throws. Bench press to supine chest pass throws with a med ball. We're projecting in free space, maximizing speed and power. Now, going on to post-activation potentiation. Complex training. A strength movement, we've potentiated. Rest 30 to 60 seconds. And then it might be something like an unloaded counter movement jump. We might do a, a heavy load prowler push into an unloaded sprint. As you can see, the neurological recruitment patterns are quite similar to each other. The pattern has to be similar to get the transference in terms of potentiation. It might be a squat to a sprint. It might be a bench press to a bench press throw. It might be a hip hinge to a broad jump. You can see what I've done there. The recruitment pattern's quite similar. The strength movement potentiates and the speed movement takes advantage of that potentiation. I'll do it to throwing a wiffle ball, right? Or throwing a can of Coke. So the strength movement potentiates the nervous system and it tricks the nervous system into thinking that can of Coke is a full can of Coke. Instead, it's only half full. So because it's lighter and you feel it, you're gonna throw it further because it tricks your nervous system because it still thinks it's a heavy Coke can when it's not. It's half empty. And that's the, that's the um, uh, how you can think of what post-activation potentiation in it, post-activation potentiation is. Most people used to think, or research, used to think it was a neurological phenomenon. What I'm saying by that is it was mediated by neurological mechanisms. Now they're saying it's mediated by muscular mechanisms at the muscular level. I think it's to do with the calcium release from the cal calcium release down the T-tubules and connects onto the um, uh, actomycin crossbreeds for crossbreed cycling, pretty much what it's saying is, to, in layman's terms, it's what's happening is you get a greater release of calcium, and calcium helps with cross-bridge cycling, which helps with force output, right? What it's saying, it's something to do with that. Now, my area is not physiology, my area is not at the muscular level, mine's at my neurological level. I like to think that it's still a neurological phenomenon because you're stimulating the central nervous system to a high degree. How do we best stimulate the central nervous system to maximize fast switch mode recruitment? There's three ways. Heavy load, low repetition, traditional strength training, max force training, max strength training. Sub-maximal load, lifted explosively, right? So there's power training, or um, uh, body weight sp um, move quickly, like sprint work. So power or speed work. And the third way, which is the most inefficient, sub-maximal loads lifted to failure. The reason why it's most inefficient, that traditional bodybuilding training, is because you're recruiting those motor units at, a, at those high threshold motor units very, very slowly. The whole idea is to recruit them high threshold fast switch motor units and do so quickly. So it makes sense, either a strength, power, or speed movement facilitates, potentiates, and then we take advantage with a similar biomechanical movement. But 
it has been shown not to be as effective with highly trained athletes. What that's saying to me is high trained athletes have a highly trained central nervous system and they, recruit, they can recruit high levels of motor units quickly. So a novice and an intermediate is less trained, larger window adaptation. Highly trained individual, not much window adaptation, have to have a high, high training stimulus and have to have a really specific training stimulus to get the transference of effect. But it's a good training tool you can use Contrast training, complex training, French contrast training, where you actually do four movements, different loading parameters. I don't have enough time to go into it right now, but post-activation potentiation is the time-efficient way to train the entire force force curve and surf the curve. Maximise force, shift the curve to the right, where greater force is produced over shorter time periods. And it's the whole goal of sport and sports performance, increase explosive force training and capacity. That is episode 58, short and sharp, concise, like usual. Good work, Woodford. I just gave myself an okay there, Pricey. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode of 58. It was on fire. I'm on today. I'm switched on. Thanks as always, Bryce. Our sponsors, MacIFitness.com.au. The best in the fucking game. Christian will fix his signature series. He's going out the door. Creek Dean and Carbohydrate. We're going to add another one very, very soon. Look out for that. Thanks very much, Bryce. Episode 58, Ask Woodford. I'll see you next week. Episode 59. I'm Christian Woodford, and this has been Ask Woodford.